Hello and welcome to the World Zarathustri Chamber of Commerce Australia series on uh, International Women's Day 2021. It's called IWD 2021, Her Story. Hi, I'm Jimmy Medora, your host today, and also the Global Director on the World Zarathustri Chamber of Commerce International Board of Directors. Every year on the 8th of March, the world celebrates International Women's Day. And there are several events that are held slightly before, on that day and after. But we at the WZCC Australia b believe that there are many, many stories that might not be able to, we may not be able to cover on that day. So what we have decided is to have a series, which we will we'll then post on our Facebook, YouTube, IGTV, etc. So without further ado, let me introduce you to, to tonight's, uh, to today's uh, guest, Saroni Roy. A Jill of many trades, Saroni is an actor, co-chair of the Equity Diversity, MEAA, and social entrepreneur. She has created Saroni Roy Foundation, SRF, a social enterprise based on three core values, diversity, sustainability, and social justice, perpetuating socio-economic and environmental well-being, creating a peaceful, inclusive one world to live and love. Saroni was named Miss India Ms. India Australia Goodwill Ambassador in 2018 for her contribution towards social causes. She's won several awards and accolades and was recently awarded the 2021 City of Parramatta Young Adult Citizen of the Year finalist for a noteworthy contribution to the City of Parramatta in Sydney and has conceptualized and hosted an extensive list of community cohesion programs, including the commemoration of Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birth anniversary drawing active participation from indigenous and international communities of Greater Western Sydney. During the bushfire catastrophe last year, her food donation drive for Addison Road Community Organization provided food to 100,000 less privileged Australians and rescued 100 tons of food from going to the landfill. Having said that, let me introduce you to Saroni Roy. Welcome, Saroni, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for having me here. And thank you so much to WZCC for doing this initiative. I think it's a fantastic and a very powerful initiative, IWD21, her story. I think we all must, the world must know powerful stories of powerful women. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So let's begin with uh, your story. You said that you've migrated to Australia recently, it's about six years ago now. So tell us the story before you came to Australia, the highs, the lows, the ups and downs, the challenges you faced and overcome. So um, I, uh, my hometown or my birthplace is Jamshedpur. Uh, it's a small town in um, the east of India and a very beautiful one, of course. And um, of course there were no such challenges uh, when I was in school, I think my parents, uh, my dad, everyone gave me a very good uh, childhood. Uh, I didn't, I pretty much lived like a princess. And then the, uh, once I finished school, I went to Bombay for my uni. And um, that's where I started living by myself and that's where the whole story began, I would say, uh, of challenges. I mean, I went through uh, a lot. Uh, I went through bullying, I went through, um, you know, uh, basically I was a small town girl who was so protected and, you know, uh, you live in such a protected environment. And especially at that time it was in Bihar, right, Jamshedpur. And in those kind of regions, um, it's not, I mean, you need to protect your daughters and, you know, protect the girls and the women because it's not that safe. Uh, so, um, so therefore I never had to had any exposure to outside world. And uh, here I was in Bombay all by myself in hostel um, in a boarding um, college. Um, I was in Sophia, Sophia College, which was a wonderful college. Uh, but then uh, I was all by myself for the first time. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was not prepared already uh, I was 
what i think 16 or yeah something like that and um, it's such a big city is such a fast city and such smart people and you know um uh, it's it's very cutthroat out there so then um i had to learn i think the biggest learning was um in a few months when i had to take the local train in bombay i think that taught I me hustling those days too yeah so that taught me hustling you know that taught me to fight back that taught taught me that i need to learn how to uh, take a stand or create a position and um, since after that i after my college i um, went into uh, editing and writing for magazines so i did journalism for more than 12 or 15 years i lived in bombay for about 10 years um, and then um, moved to bangalore uh, which was the it capital in india and then I didn't really find um jobs that I was uh, you know of my liking or of my background which is basically I was interviewing Shahrukh Khan and interviewing M Night Shyamalan in Bombay and covering Lakme Fashion Weeks and you know um all of that and then suddenly I was in this uh, IT capital where I had um nothing to do with lifestyle and fashion and luxury and then I didn't want to sort of do tech writing um so i switched to pr of course i had qualifications in pr my post grads is in pr so i switched to pr for tech clients for google hp visa sap those kind of clients it was a new world for me a different world for me and then um i was diagnosed with cancer so um that was i think the biggest uh, turning point uh, of my life biggest shocker and biggest uh, turning point in my life um so and the uh, the the thing is that when i went into surgery i didn't even know it's a malignant tumor so i only knew it's a benign one and we just had to remove it anyway you know you can't just leave it there inside so uh, it was inside my thyroid gland and um when in surgery the surgeons and the doctors they kind of figured that um, all the cysts and the tumors had turned malignant so um that's why the entire thyroid gland had to be removed and um then i went went for radiation which is radioactive iodine um therapy and um so that was the time i kind of realized that I could have been dead mm-hmm. now and I haven't even lived my life at all mm-hmm. all my life till this time uh I only lived for others for my parents um for society for um a brother or anyone whoever told me whatever way to live conform to society just just live that way mm-hmm. you know so i only lived for everyone else uh, i never did something that is making me happy uh, i didn't even know what makes me happy actually so um uh, you know uh, and then i kind of decided that you know i kind of wanted to live in different part of the world i hadn't even traveled much i wanted to live in a different part of the world i wanted to do something that i had never done before and I promised one thing to myself that I am going to live every day of my second life just for myself. I will prioritize myself. I will um you know provide all sorts of love that I all the deep love that I have been offering and giving to others. I will give some of that to myself first, mm-hmm. you know, uh and prioritize myself. So uh that's when I uh, thought of moving out and um you know, we got the visa for a uh, pr visa for australia for new south wales and uh, that's how in 2014 uh, we landed in uh, sydney mm. and uh, the thing was that i had never visited australia before migrating to australia and um, i only knew that i had only seen australia in uh, bollywood hindi films right and so beautiful and uh, i was like what can be what can go wrong in sydney you know <laughs> what could go wrong so i'm just going to Famous go yeah and then i mean and i was like what? the thing is that i had nothing to lose i had reached a point where i had nothing to lose because i had lost 
everything. I had lost, lost my health, my self-confidence. I had lost everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could lose my entire life. So, you know, I had nothing to lose. Uh, so that's why I came here for a fresh start, like a, a place where I have no history, let's say. And, um, and I said, you know what, there's Sydney Opera House. So that's all I need. I think I'll just watch opera. I'll just do skydiving. I'll just do deep sea diving. Maybe work, work at a Starbucks. Maybe just do anything, you know. But not do the things that I was that doing before. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> Fantastic! What a what a story! What a story! I mean, I, I can understand a small small town girl moving into the cutthroat jungle that Bombay can be. And I love Bombay because I was born there. But still, it is a cutthroat life there. And only the fittest can survive. So it's very much like a jungle where you only, you know, like you mentioned the train, you know, and how you can get on and get <laughs> off. Uh, I, I, I still shudder when I think of those days. When if you want to punish someone, yes. you get, tell them to get into a Virar fast. <laughs> yes. Yes. And Just get, get, get off in the somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Get off and, and like <laughs> yes. Try some that. station. You yeah. know. So maybe that we can do that for the final race. So what's the what's it called? Yeah. The final race, Australia or something. <laughs> well, you know, maybe that's what we can do. The amazing race or whatever it is called. So no, that's good. So yeah. So what are, so you came here with no baggage, with no history, of uh, or no connections or whatever, which is quite a daunting uh, task when you look look back at it. Uh, tell me, what kind of challenges did you then have to face to establish yourself? In, in the fields that you are already exposed to. But I, I know that you wanted to do something different too. And I, I think you've already gone into acting and modeling and you know that kind of thing too. So there must have been challenges for you. Yeah, so um, the thing is that when I landed, uh, like you said that I landed with no baggage uh, and that's literally that that i landed in two suitcases <laughs> and i, I didn't mean that literally but yeah <laughs> I, I mean it literally <laughs> because it was literally two suitcases <laughs> and um i lived in a garage converted into a room in strathfield um for about the first month also because we didn't have money or savings or anything and um but then i had uh, i had lived a very, uh, you know, uh, like a life of struggle, but in a good way, I would say. Bombay made me tough, mm. okay? It made me titanium strong, mm. that I can survive anywhere. Mm. If I can survive in Bombay, I can survive anywhere. True. So, uh, because uh, when I was in hostel and when I, you know, I, I went through a lot in terms of sexual assault to, um, you know, to... Uh, to maybe not having enough money to even eat at times or whatever, because I had told my dad that I am not going, never going to ask you for extra money or whatever you send me, that's fine. But apart from that, I'm going to, uh, you know, earn. Uh, I started doing a job when I was 19, so I paid for my post grads and everything while I was working and all that. So uh, I've lived that tough life. So Sydney wasn't that tough for me. Because I ha I was used to living on a vada pao or mm. a ban maska yeah, and a banana, water. you know. Yeah. So I mean, kya bread jam nahi milega, or bread <laughs> or bread butter nahi kha sakte. Kya banana nahi milega khane <laughs> Sydney mein, you know. Uh, it can't be worse it or whatever. Bad, yeah. So, uh, but then yes, the challenge was that uh, Sydney is very expensive again in terms of rent and everything, and uh, I wasn't getting a job in spite of so much of experience mm. in media mm. and PR uh, and qualifications, I wasn't getting a job in media uh, because I have no local experience, local qualifications. And I was like, hire me as an intern, but even that did not happen. So uh, I just got into, got any job that I got. Uh, like I think a lot of us, when we migrate to a new country, we do that. Mm -hmm. So I got into like a call center, um, customer service for Telstra, uh, you know, just take up. Then I also worked for TRA, which is Tourism Research Australia, mm -hmm. for some time at International Airport. Then I also did my Cambridge uh, ESL teaching course, which is English as a second language, mm -hmm. uh, to um, teaching English as a second language to speakers of other languages. Uh, and I started teaching in language centers in Sydney. That was amazing experience. That was a, a fantastic experience. But um, my left leg started acting up and I started getting excru excruciating pain 
in my left leg and uh, it was crippling me and I was again bedridden and I couldn't walk, stand, sit yeah. or do anything. <laughs> so leave alone teaching because teaching involves hours of standing and teaching. So I couldn't do that anymore. And um, now I was like, I don't know what to do because every time I try and progress and I want to do something and start all over, my health just pulls me back. Mm. Um, and how many times am I going to uh, get up and be strong and just run or walk or fly or whatever? So uh, I was binge watching Netflix as all of us, I think, do in our darkest hours, we turn to artists and entertainment and the TV and cinema. So, um, and uh, I was watching this uh, series called Marco Polo, uh, and I saw this Indian uh, looking actor who had backed a very good role, uh, and I loved his performance. And um, so that's uh, when I, I just Googled him, you know, and he turned out to be an Australian actor oh. of Indian descent. And uh, then I was like, uh, wow, and I just read about him, and that which film schools he went to, and you know, what, what he did, and which shows he went to, and things like that. And then I was like, um, you know, I need to somehow, keep my mental health or my mental sanity in place and this frustration and this depression can't go on and I can't go back to dancing so I have been a dancer throughout my life really? I'm trained in four dance forms okay. uh, since the age of three so Which it's forms? Uh, Kathak, Odyssey, Bharatnatyam and Flamenco oh, Flamenco? Yeah That's really interesting Like Flamenco you know flamenco. how it happened in Bombay I was um, of course uh, because I've dance was my life flying you know it was it was everything for me stage was everything for me since the age of three and uh, but then in India once you get into a job you can't continue mm. these things I tried but I couldn't so I had to quit dancing but then um, this flamenco happened in Bombay when uh, I was in college third year I think final year and um, you know a friend of mine said that there is an audition um, for um, flamenco dancers for Kathak dancers and uh, there's an adaptation of the Carmen um, oh, right. you know mm. uh, so why don't you go because you're a trained Kathak dancer so I'm a Bisharad in Kathak so then um, I went for the audition it was Alec Padamse who was doing this um, um, play uh, so I got in I, I cracked the audition and I got in and that's how I learned flamenco they trained us in flamenco for Carmen uh, so um, I think it's is the best thing that has happened to me I think uh, no I think acting is the best thing so <laughs> coming back to Marco Polo when I was watching Marco Polo so then um, I wanted to do, needed a creative outlet, mm. but I can't go back to dancing because of the left leg pain. And so that's when I kind of thought that, you know, I've always loved cinema and um, this, but then I never had the time to study cinema. Um, so maybe, you know, why mm. not? This could be great. So then I called the film school next morning the actor went to, um, you know, and I told them that, can I do this workshop? I really want to do this workshop. And then, um, so, uh, then he told me, yeah, sure, uh, there is this, um, you know, the school, uh, drum school that I'm doing it in, it's in DVI, just register. So I registered and I went there and uh, that's it. I just fell in love with this profession and since then I've studied in so many film schools and I've done so many classes and courses and of course I mean when I went to the film school the first day the first class um, uh, I think that was in screen wise um, and so in screen wise uh, the first day you know they do a footage they shoot mm. uh, whatever scenes you've performed and uh, I looked at my footage and I when they replay it and I was like oh my god I'm so ugly <laughs> fat and dark and there is nothing right about me I should not be here I should not be on screen this is just not uh, going to work ever and uh, 
the teacher actually asked us at the end of the, you know after replaying all the footages uh, she asked us that um, so how many of you don't like yourselves on screen everyone raised their hands oh, right. <laughs> and i was like oh, really <laughs> <laughs> you guys are saying this, you know, um, you're way more experienced than me and, you know, all of them, most of them must have started when they were eight years old or something, mm -hmm. but I'm starting now and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so, uh, but then, yeah, I, I, I realized that soon acting and being on set when I'm shooting and things like that, it, I could forget the pain mm -hmm. for some time, mm -hmm. for those hours. So it became like a healing mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. I forget everything when I'm on set or I'm in class or, you know, I'm doing this. You're a new persona. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's a profession which allows you to be emotional, to be uh, vulnerable, mm. to be yourself, to be um, whatever you are, you know. Uh, so there is no pretense, actually. It is pretending it for is a living, pretense, yes. but then there is no pretense. It is such a beautiful word. Uh, That's fantastic. I mean, we live in multicultural Australia and multicultural Sydney, and uh, I'm sure that as a woman of color with no experience in Australia in acting, you must have had some some problems trying to get a role because you don't fit the, the blonde, fair kind of person that people usually go for. Even in, you know, on TV, we see the, the announcers, etc. They're mainly, mostly, now it's changing, but m mainly they've been women of, uh, you know, the fair, this thing, and uh, blue, blue eyes and blonde hair. So how did you cope with that? Because there must have been quite a few disappointments how did you cope with that? And how did you overcome any resistance that you might have had for yourself in getting, in, in breaking into acting? Yeah, so the thing is that uh, I came into the industry without any expectations, right? And that I will ever get anything. Mm -hmm. So that was one. When acting gigs started coming to me and when modeling started coming to me, I was shocked and surprised pleasantly. Um, because I never thought I could be an actor and I never planned it and I never, um, I've actually never planned anything in my life. I never planned to be a journalist as well. So, but I, I did that. Uh, but then modeling was something I never planned and uh, because, you know, I'm not skinny, I'm not tall, the runway model tall and um, all that. But then here there were huge brands, world's leading brands, who were approaching me via my Instagram mm. uh, to that they want me as their brand ambassador for their next campaign. And um, I would be probably their first Indian origin model um, to be for that brand. So this was amazing. I mean, I was just, I think, saying a yes initially to the opportunities that were coming to me. And photographers started approaching me, really experienced photographers, award winner photographers. I am so blessed to be approached by these people. It must be like, you know, um, it's, it's so, it's just surprising and I'm very lucky to be working with such people and learning from them. But then coming back to the point of being a person of color or actor of color, the thing is that that ha that resistance is there in every industry. But yes, in acting, definitely a lot. Because when I understood the casting process, I'll give you a small example. Like let's say tomorrow uh, I get a casting call and I'm playing a young mother. So the child ha actor has to look like me. Mm. The job jawline, the cheekbones, the eye color, the hair color, you know, it has to match. I have to look like his mother, you know, or his or her mother. So, and if I have a husband in like the co-actor, so the, the child has to look like us. And otherwise, if I'm playing a sister, then the brother and sister have to look alike, mm -hmm. you know. So the understanding the crafting process really helped because then I was like, okay, there are going to always be things 
because I'm, I'm going to be rejected on things I cannot control. Mm. I cannot change my jawline or my cheekbones or my structure or my, you know, the way I look. So it is going to be rejection. So we get rejected 10 times a day mm. and you have to get used to it. Initially, as you think, oh, what did I do wrong in that audition or I didn't get the job? You know, as you do all sorts of analysis, then you just have to stop analyzing. You just have to know that it's not going to happen. And you know, there are so many factors that go into actually casting uh, the actor finally who gets the job. And again, it's different for commercials, it's different for film, uh, you know, depends on the format, the medium, mm. so many things. Like it could be just the reason that, you know, uh, you probably, um, I mean, of course a name talent or someone, you know, people would put their money on it. So it is challenging. It is very, very difficult to keep your, um, not get depressed and not feel, mm. lose that hope. Yes. Uh, but then, the thing is that for me, one is, one thing that I did was I never put all my eggs in one basket. So I always have many streams, multiple streams of work, mm -hmm. streams of profession, and which is me. Because once a journalist, always a journalist, mm -hmm. once a writer, how can you take that writer out of me? So I still write. Mm -hmm for publications whenever I have the time. Okay, I still freelance. Or if there is a content person or you know, you need some help or something, I'll still do it. It's there in me. Mm. So so I have multiple skills and talent. And I feel that it is very important for us to explore these multiple dimensions in mm. us. So as we don't reach a position where we are stagnant, where we have nowhere to go, mm. where probably you know, there are so many actors who commit suicide, yes. right? Yes. It's so such a high rate of suicide rates in, in acting mm. industry because it's so much pressure mm. on us. But if you have multiple professions that you're equally passionate about, mm. or maybe a little less passionate, or maybe it's the second ranking thing, top is acting, then second is something, third is something, mm. then you, that situation will never come. Mm. So yeah, so basically, Jimmy, what I'm trying to say is that th how I deal with it is that, you know, I first kind of try to see that, you know, I don't, like I said, that I don't put all my eggs in one basket. And, you know, therefore, when I'm not acting, I am, you know, modeling. If I'm not doing modeling, then I'm recording music videos or doing voice acting or maybe, you know, community work. Um, uh, and I'm also an entrepreneur, so, you know, I have lots of my um, initiatives planned and also multiple sources of income that is important in this industry speci especially so that we don't reach that dead end kind of a situation where I have nowhere to go and you know uh, I kind of commit suicide or whatever because if I quit they win you know that's the thing that you know and I don't want I want to win the battle I want to win this fight and I will not go anywhere. No matter how many times I'm told, why don't you go and try Bollywood? I'm told so many times, uh, why you never tried it in India, mm. in Bombay, in Bollywood, uh, you know? Uh, so it's, it's a way of saying that, why don't you go back mm. from where you came? So, um, that's going to always be there and uh, in spite of i mean you know it's it's there in every industry also even in community workspace mm. the people who are there in sydney uh, in my own community the south asian community or indian community even they don't want to accept newcomers new people you know it's uh, so acceptance is difficult mm. it is difficult to be accepted but we are changing the game we are tr pushing the boundaries we are doing a lot of work especially in terms of equity diversity committee within the MEAA which is media entertainment arts alliance the actors union the performers union the media uh, and performers union so equity diversity basically works for for the rights of performers of color um, performers with disability and uh, also the LGBTQIA plus community and 
you know, everyone and anyone who is underrepresented. So because as an actor, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenge which I still face is representation, getting a good agent, mm -hmm. right? Because if I'm not a top actor, experienced actor, I don't get a good agent. But how do I become an experienced actor? You know, if you don't give me a chance. But then, you know, uh, that's what I had promised myself anyway. When I didn't get a me job in media, I'm, I'm quite a, you know, uh, I accept challenges very well, uh, I would say. Mm. And I make these promises to myself. When I did not get a job in media, I told myself that, you know, today you are not hiring me as a writer or editor, but tomorrow you're going to write about me. Good in one. your magazines. Good one. You know? So uh, that was, um, so I'm trying and... And I would say that, you know, all actors and performers, whoever is new or at any stage and feels that I'm going to give up or something, don't give up. Because if you give up, they win. Don't let them win. You have to be the winner. You have to stay. So uh, just, just keep at it. I like that. I like that very much. Thank you for that. We have all seen through your social media presence, the accolades that you have received while you've been here in the six years, and uh, the recognition you've received, like the award you mentioned earlier on in your intro, Parramatta Award, you're also, I think, uh, Miss India, Australia Goodwill Ambassador, etc. So we've seen the success, but underlying that success, I think, would be a lot of hardship, would have been a lot of... Uh, problems or whatever that, that arises. How did you deal with them? Well, what are they first? I mean, if you can tell us, what are, the, what are these problems that you've had, the hurdles that you've had to overcome? And uh, yeah, you know, what, what did you do? Because I think people are interested in knowing not only just the success, but they have to know that to, for that, it's like a duck in the water. You know, you see this serenely s floating through, but down they're paddling pretty, pretty hard. So. There must be something that, that you would have faced which you had to overcome. Of course, uh, there's a lot. And like I said, it's in every industry, not just acting, uh, but even in the community workspace, um, even as volunteers. I mean, like, we're not even paid mm. for the job we do, but there is so much of... Um, I mean, I've had very good experiences, of course. I would say uh, most of the experiences in the community workspace has been amazing, amazing people to yeah. work with. Uh, and um, uh, beautiful collaborations, wonderful outcomes. And uh, therefore I could achieve and reach so far, I would say without their help, I wouldn't be here. But there were a few experiences which actually really traumatized me in the sense that um, in 2019 when I was working for the Mahatma Gandhi 150th birth anniversary at that time it was a huge project that I had and logistically it was a very large scale one so I had to go to a lot of people a lot of organizations government officials for support and uh, funding and sponsorship and things like that so and at a time I actually had given up that it will never happen and you know all of that and uh, somehow it it did happen but at a huge cost I would say in the sense that I was aggressively bullied and uh, I was insulted um, several times and um, yeah I, I mean it, it was it went so far that I had to actually walk out of that project um, mm. you know in the end and um, because I knew that they don't want me anymore you know like you like I said that they want you to quit they don't want you there you're you're new you you either be a sycophant to them you either you know uh, just they're dictating you they're going to control you they're going to insult you you just keep you know uh, keep B tolerating that mm. treatment, uh, you know. Otherwise, quit. But that's what they want. So I kept at it till I could. Uh, and because I had worked so hard for a year, I did not want to quit. Uh, so I 
kept going uh, throughout uh, that whole traumatic experience. But uh, in the end, I, I walked out because it was just getting uh, too much for me uh, to bear. And um, so, yeah, and since then, I obviously didn't want to work with those people. You don't want to go back to your perpetrator uh, or the person who's done this uh, to you. Uh, the trauma still haunts me. I would say, but I've learned my lessons at the same time, right? Uh, then you know you have to be aware of these people and um, certain people uh, who probably show a different persona and image in front of the society, and but otherwise they are something different, mm. uh, absolutely. And they don't actually, the, the problem is not that they're different or they have different personalities or whatever. The problem is that the cause we were working for was undermined. Mm. isn't it yes. that's the thing yes. that's the loss yes. i would say that's yes. the pain yes. the painful part is not that i was bullied mm. i've been bullied so many times and i'm going to again come back at you strong stronger than before okay mm. and uh, the world doesn't end for me it's it's only begun uh, so um, and i have so many lovely people like yourself oh. uh, like WZCC and uh, such wonderful organizations and such wonderful people I meet every day who want to work with me, yes. who uh, collaborate with me and there is so much that we can do and achieve. So I would just, I move on from there, learn my lessons, um, you know, uh, and just move on. And yeah, it, it, it haunts me. It still gives me those jitters and shivers <laughs> at times. But then these recognitions and awards, is something that keeps me going again. Because I'm like, oh, finally someone noticed. Mm. Finally someone noticed. That's all a volunteer wants, yes. by the way. That small recognition, or that name, that, that appreciation, yes. Yes. that's Just all, exactly. Because we don't, volunteers, you know, community workers, volunteers, we don't work for money or fame or anything. We work for the cause. And we work for, we give our time, heart and soul on 500%. Yes. I used to wake up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 3 a.m. and work on these projects, right? And I have a full-time job and I had uh, acting and I had auditions and I had shoots and I had so many and things. And the pain that you've been suffering. Pain and health issues, doctors, issues, yes. scans, you know, everything. On my birthdays, most of the time I'm doing CT scans or, you know, <laughs> whole body scans. So, uh, yeah, uh, so, so people, don't value it. That's the painful part. But then I would say okay. there are wonderful people out there who want to do good work. And um, yeah, I, <laughs> I fully understand, and I fully understand where you're coming from as far as recognition and even a even just a uh, just a simple that was good or something as a volunteer that you want to hear. I'm a volunteer as such, even though I'm a director. Exactly. I'm a volunteer and. Uh, the last five and a half years devoted to the WZCC. And I did that not because, uh, you know, if we didn't get paid or whatever. I did it because I have a passion for it. I want to create a passion for entrepreneurship. I want to create a passion for youth and for young women. And, uh, you know, because we have a rich tradition, the Parsis, the Zoroastrians, have a very rich tradition in entrepreneurship. So when we come, when we are in a, in a country like Australia, we are starting from scratch. So someone like us, someone like me, or, and some of my other members, committee members, we are putting in a lot of our time and effort to ensure that uh, the people around here in multicultural Australia, Sydney also, New Zealand, they become aware of our rich traditions. And our youth should know that uh, there is a very rich tradition and that they are going to be the torch bearers in the future. But like you said, it's very rare, <laughs> rare for people to say that was well done, Jimmy. Uh, and then you know, some more often than not, they say, "Oh, yeah, that wasn't bad," and then move on. <laughs> sort of thing. So, it does help. It does I help. think uh, also, Jimmy, I would like to add that wherever I've gone, uh, maybe because I'm an artist and um, you know a writer, and we value credit so mm. much, mm. bylines so much. Mm. You mm. can't take a story. Don't take a story from a writer without a byline, right? Mm. Don't steal it. It's no. plagiarism. It's That's IP, right. mm. uh, you know, that you're stealing. So I come from that background, and I'm very staunch supporter of giving credit to people, you know. And I, wherever I've worked, 
whichever organization, community organizations, NGOs, everywhere, not even one volunteer's name have I missed ever. Absolutely. In spite of being told by people, why are you putting their names? Mm. They're just volunteers. Mm. It should be my event or you know yes. that person's event. Yes. That person wants the spotlight, isn't it? Mm. Uh, but what about the 100 volunteers, 40 volunteers, 30 volunteers, who just kids, youth, Behind youngster, the scenes. everyone mm. worked so hard yes. on this. How can you not give their name somewhere at least, yes. you know, or, or take their name or just, you know, do that recognition. So I have every time I've done that. In spite, you know, if you see my social media posts also, you will see every photo has a photo credit. If, if there was a hair and makeup artist, there has to be a credit. Whether I shot it whichever year, mm. years ago, mm. whether that photographer is on social media or no, whether that hair and makeup artist is still there on social media or no, I mm. don't care. Mm. If I have the knowledge, mm. I will put that credit there. Mm. So I think we need to inculcate and develop this culture mm. by ourselves. Like you said right now that you have not probably got that appreciation or that recognition. Not I always. Think, yeah, I do get it. But sometimes yeah. maybe you yeah. felt that, you know, mm. whenever, whatever mm. time. And I'm sure there are many who feel that. So I think that culture needs to be inculcated mm. even more and more. And starting from us that, you know, each other, giving credit to each other yes. is so important. Like right now, you're doing such a great initiative here right now. And I'm so thankful and grateful uh -huh. to you for doing this and Mutual. bringing out these stories uh, to everyone to get, you know, get that hope. I think you, you, like you and some of the others, we will be, uh, you know, s recording shortly. They have to be, to in my mind, a beacon on the hill like how they say in, in the United States, you're a beacon in the hill, on the hill, and you're a role model. Because there might, there might be young women, or even young men, I, I suppose, uh, depending on the thing, but who, are, who want to be actors or who want to be models, and they are people of different color or you know, religion or whatever it might be. Diversity is not always recognized. So uh, your example, the example of the others, is, is actually in my mind why I want to do this series of podcasts mm -hmm. so that people can then say if she can do it I can do exactly and if you don't have that kind of backing what's the point of Absolutely. having a podcast I like mean, you know like uh, I used to say when I go into modeling um, I used to say that the entire modeling world is was mostly about you know size four size six mm. and this and I used to be like oh my god I'm like you have to pay me double because I'm double of that, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, if you if you want a size six model, you have to pay me double, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or more than that maybe. <laughs> so, you know, because, um, yeah, so uh, I think cancer kind of taught me that. Uh, uh, and I would say to all women or everyone who's been through a challenge like that, um, illness like that, or even for that matter, I mean, especially women, I can speak for um, us because uh, mm. I am a woman and I have experienced quite a few changes in my body, in my mental health, physical health, emotional health, mm. in every way, confidence levels. So I would really say that, you know, give yourself that chance and keep reinventing yourself. Uh, it's We are like, each of us actually are like a prism. Mm. We're like a diamond. We have multiple dimensions which we have never explored mm. or discovered. We don't know what we have. Like I did not know I could be an actor or model mm. or even teacher, you know. Yeah. So I didn't know that. So you just have to give it a shot. Give it a shot. I want to sort of ask you mainly about the, the foundation that you have started, the Saroni Roy Foundation, and especially you know, what was the intent, what was the vision that you have for this foundation, what kind of initiatives you have already done or, or put into action, or what are the initiatives that you plan to have, especially with International Women's Day coming up or, you know, in March. So give us, an, uh, give us a bit of a flavor of uh, the foundation. So, um, Jimmy Saroon Roy Foundation, uh, or SRF, uh, I established that in 2020. 
just a year really? last year mm. uh, it was covid had not hit us actually at that time uh, so this was founded in january 2020 beginning of a new decade mm. uh, and um, uh, i had always thought of doing uh, like something having my own organization uh, like a social enterprise and things like that uh, because i've been working in community workspace like social wor- as a social worker since i was in school mm-hmm. you know um, so it's been like decades of uh, work that i've done and um, so i wanted an organization which sort of because i've done so much work in diversity sustainability and social justice basically i worked in the world peace space for quite a while now uh and because of which i received the miss india australia goodwill ambassador title at the miss india australia beauty pageant mm. um and uh, i've done quite a few initiatives so far but then i was doing it helping other organizations and you know doing it uh, not in a very uh, streamlined way <coughs> where i want to reach and things like that so therefore i thought that i'll found uh, i founded this organization as a social enterprise mm-hmm. um a social enterprise would be a midway between a charity and an uh, a business enterprise and um, which works on so when it comes to world peace that's the end goal but how do we attain world peace or mm-hmm. how do we take those baby steps mm. uh, towards world peace so that would be diversity the three pillars or the three core values are diversity sustainability and social justice and um so i feel if we can meet these three pillars or these three core values we can take those steps and progressive steps towards world peace like in terms of diversity if we can you know provide a multicultural uh, kind of a more harmonious interfaith dialogue and those kind of things a, a lot more of that if we understand each other's scriptures if we understand um so i've done i've been a part of these interfaith dialogues mm-hmm. in the past um and uh, i've learned from all these organizations that i worked with and therefore i thought that um i must uh, create an organization of my own and uh, so that i can move forward and also when i'm helping others then you know uh, it it's so it's basically synonymous to me mm. it's aroni roy whatever i am doing it stands for me and um yeah it basically like if you have um like i did uh, in the bushfire uh, catastrophe that time uh, when i did the initiative for a food donation drive for adi road uh, food pantry um uh, we could provide groceries and meals to 100,000 people and rescue 100 tons of food from going to the landfill and that was just 3 months of that food donation mm. drive that we could do mm. you know i couldn't continue doing it again because of covid I'm not able to do that physical face to face meetings with people and therefore it's been a bit of a challenge to do these kind of um, community uh, driven things because I need other people to contribute to this yes. um so that has been difficult but then if we are able to do these things uh, in whatever small way so I think that's the goal of Sir Henry Roy Foundation uh to be a social enterprise and um I felt that a lot of times um I mean we we are actually in a generation where all of us want the money or whatever we we are entrepreneurs or whatever we are doing we also have we are also each of us are working towards a cause which is close to our heart mm-hmm. and that's social entrepreneurs actually so um yeah I, I think that's serene roy foundation for you and in terms of the initiatives that i have in mind um the one of the things which i had briefly mentioned when i won the miss india australia goodwill ambassador title actually and it's something that i had not launched it so far and uh, i am going to speak about it for the first time on your podcast wow. today thank you um and it's very relevant for the IWD International Women's Day 2021 um 
So one of the campaigns that I had done, which was two years ago when I started, was body positivity, mm. which is as a cancer survivor, body diversity, and you know those kind of things. I've been doing that. And the other one, which is going to be, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, is called Train the Boys. Okay. Okay. And uh, it's basically that it stems from the whole experiences that I've had in uh, in my in India, uh, and also here, of course, in India because. I've lived there, so I can only speak for myself, my personal experiences that I've had. Uh, so violence and crime against women is is rampant and prevalent everywhere worldwide. We all know that. And we have made such good progress, positive progress, and so much efforts have been put in uh, worldwide to empower women, to educate girl child, uh, to uh, make them aware of the sexual threats and all of that. And we have talked about training our girls in martial arts. And you know, when I was, let's say, um, assaulted or there was a rape uh, case that was there in the news, um, a lot of the girls in school, in my school and college, a lot of them would say, oh, you know, we should all be trained in martial arts. We should all carry a pepper spray mm. uh, with us, or carry a hammer or something. You know, God knows how will that? How are we going to manage that? But then, I mean, uh, you know, that's good. Yes, it's it's great to sort of train us in martial arts and, you know, um, be able to sort of have that defense uh, ready. But then, I mean, it it is only an aid to the problem. We are not really looking into the root cause of the problem there, because we're just putting a Band-Aid mm. on top of that wound, you know, uh, which is there since ages now. But I would say that what we need to do is now, probably, is to pay attention to the boys. Because rape or abuse or crime or violence against women it's not really about um, you know which strata economic background you come from, uh, which country you're from, what religion you're from, what age group you're from. It's just worldwide and it's everywhere. It is a psychological <coughs> issue that we are seeing, mm. and it's a it's it's something that probably these juvenile delinquents or the drug addicts or the rapists or whoever did not get that kind of training or guidance when they were really young. Mm. The value system was a miss there. Because otherwise, how do you explain that, you know, let's say in, in India, I have experienced personally assault and, you know, uh, the bullying and these kind of things. But then not all men are doing it. Yeah, only some are doing it, right? So what is the difference? The difference is the guidance mm. and the value system that they have, that they were brought up with, mm. you know. So maybe these juvenile delinquents did not get that guidance. Mm. So I think if we can do something to help the men or empower the boys, you know, when they're young, mm. how how can we can we look into those things, factors? Like, for example, I would just say something that, you know, we always say gentlemen, mm. right? Gentlemen. But then the moment the boy is crying, oh, stop crying like a girl. So crying or expressing emotions or um, uh, showing your vulnerability mm. or is a weakness, is a sign of uh, femininity. Uh, you're girlish, you're mm. feminine, mm. you know. So it's a weakness. So we are telling them to be gentlemen without the gentleness, right? We, we don't want them to be gentle, mm. because that's weak. But they, we want them to be gentlemen. How is that possible? Mm. So we are not letting the boys be empathi empathetic. They, they lose the capability to love or empathize or be vulnerable, or feel hurt, mm. or express, express the hurt, the hurt yes. even, Very you know. Important. 
the pain. And that is actually, you know, uh, spiraling I- into s- a mental disorder mm, mm. and vengeance and misogyny mm. and this hatred and this frustration and anger which is built up and then one day j- they just went it out on mm. someone, o- on a woman mm. who's weak. Yes, or is deemed physically to be weak. weak. Mm. Yeah, physically weak, mm. I would say. Mm. She's not weak, but she's physically weak. Mm. If 10 men just grab me right now, I can't do anything. Mm. I'm sorry, even if I'm trained in martial arts, I yeah. might not be able to do anything at that time. Because, because assault and, you know, a rape or, or this, it affects your brain first. Your brain freezes with fear. Whatever you've learned goes out of the window. Whatever pepper spray or a, any hammer that you have in your handbag, mm. it, y- you freeze with fear. Mm. Mm. If 10 men surround me, or even two men yeah. surround yeah. me, or yeah. follow me, yeah. stalking me, yeah. I'm scared. Of course. I can't even, uh, I, when I went through the assault, um, you know, myself, I, I couldn't scream, I couldn't, I was choked. Mm. I lost my voice. Mm. So uh, then w- what do you expect from me? Yeah. You know, how do you expect me to punch him or do anything? Mm. My brain is not functioning with fear, you know? Mm. It's fear. So, um, so I think that's where I'm coming from that, you know, there's a very beautiful video, um, I think on YouTube, uh, if all of you, whoever understands Hindi, I think uh, you should watch it. It's by this uh, Hindi film, the Bollywood actor, Ayushman Khurana. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, Gentleman Kise Kehte Hai. Gentleman Kise Kehte Hai. I would really watch, want all Is of you. Is it on Netflix? Uh, no, it's on YouTube. Oh, it's on it's YouTube, a small sorry. video mm. that he's created mm. and it's such a uh, beautiful one. I think everyone uh, uh, should watch it. Uh, it. It really talks about this whole thing where we actually stop and, you know, we actually curb and stop boys to lose their, we actually, you know, make them, s- we are so harsh on them and that they lose their capacity to love or empathize or be gentle. So, yeah, so basically my point is, uh, what I'm trying to say here, Jimmy, is that with Train the Boys, uh, what I want to say is that however smart, independent, educated, and, you know, talented my daughter is, let's say, you know, if I have a daughter tomorrow, so, and I send her, let's say, to the Oxford University or whichever, wherever, mm. I've given her the best mm. uh, that, this world offers mm. but if her classmates her the male friends or the male classmates or you know the uh, male members of the society she's surrounded by if they don't have the correct value system she's still not safe mm. so empowering my daughter has really not worked mm. she's still not safe so if we want to really make this world a safer place for everyone, not just girls, but for everyone, I think we need to start looking at the root of the problem, which is training them or guiding them, nurturing them, mm-hmm. raising more kind mm-hmm. and empowered men, rather. Because, yes, we are empowering women, but are we empowering men to handle these empowered and strong women? Because they are really getting insecure yes. and threatened when a smart, independent, um, you know, uh, secure, confident woman walks in that room. Yes. Because they are insecure and they are not ready to handle mm. that situation or that that mm. person at that time. So I think that's where um, Train the Boys comes in. And I would really want individuals, organizations, NGOs, volunteers, across the globe t- whoever wants to feels or relates to this i would want to work with you mm. i want to work with everyone across the globe and uh, think about how we can actually help this situation i'd love to help because i think what you said is it makes sense because i mean you know traditionally especially in indian households we have experienced that 
the boy is always right and you know he's treated with kid gloves whereas the daughter you've know, got to learn how to cook blah, 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 blah. it's changing a lot nowadays and especially in, in in our community over here but i think the emphasis has always been oh she attracted this or she is a slut or if you if you pardon the french or is she has she is to blame because she wore a mini skirt or a revealing dress or whatever it might be so while that might be the case it is also the men who then respond to that so they have to learn how to 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 react and the thing is there were men who did not respond that way mm. so that's what you need to learn yes that's the difference i'm trying to see mm. that you know uh, not in the all indian men are doing it no. or not not every man is doing it no. you know so why are only some doing this you know mm. so that because there has been a problem when they were growing up they they did not have secure family uh, relations or um, you know no one to guide them or but that secure and value system uh, in place so i feel that's the reason and mm. sort of um, it it starts from that tender age because once they are an adult it's difficult to sort of yes change Leopard them change or shape kind of their thing. mindset yeah. mm. uh, it it's possible mm. uh, but then difficult mm. uh, so yeah I <laughs> on that very positive note i think we we should conclude this session I I don't know I I don't want to go into a very long thank you but I sincerely thank you for your help and for being here today giving up your precious time and also for all your insights I think the story is is there and what we've actually gained today is not only the story and all the difficulties that you've you've had to live through and get through but how you overcome them and i think i like the indomitable spirit that you're being saying that look you know i'm not going to let them win i think that's that's the take away for me at least and i hope that's the take away for many of my our listeners today so thank you very much saroni for your uh, presentation for being here and uh, definitely with uh, the wzcc australia if there is any way we can participate and uh, you know collaborate in future i'd love to help I'd re- dearly love to help because I think you have the ideas and I think sometimes you can't just do everything alone you need you need a bit of a network and we definitely can leverage and that and I don't want to do it alone <laughs> because it's not for me <laughs> I know it's for everyone yeah, yeah. so uh, and it's for billions of people around the world so I want all the billions of people to join me That in this actually and uh, that's why uh, you can connect uh, all your listeners everyone actually you can connect with me on instagram uh, facebook uh, my website which mm-hmm. is sarenroy.com uh, there's a contact us form you can contact me from there so i'm everywhere i'm all over i'm very very approachable uh, so if you have ideas if you if you think this is something you want to work um, with me for i know there are many organizations who are al- already uh, doing a lot of work in this in this space uh, but i also wanted to because my experiences are very um, uh, you know only two countries right india and australia so i would want other people from mm. different countries to yes. join me yes. and share their experiences yes. and therefore we'll be able to sort of help everyone yes. uh, worldwide because i don't want it to be just about uh, these two countries or something because the problem is overarching and it's yes. huge mm. uh, for um so yeah okay. hey, thank you so much jimmy no, no, my our pleasure i think i think we've learned a lot from you today <laughs> and uh, you, you out there If you are interested in what uh, Saroni has uh, been saying get in touch with her let's work together all of us right from, from right from the world doesn't have to be only the WZCC maybe your friends family etc so thank you very much Saroni and thank you everyone for listening in thank you thank you so much